What is going on, everybody? Welcome to the Inventing the Future podcast. Our mission with this show is to introduce you to the entrepreneurs and ideas that will inspire and empower you to solve the world's biggest problems. This is Julian Alvarez, and I'm a Gen Z entrepreneur and soon-to-be software engineer at Facebook. My guest today is Francois Guello. Have you... Let me start by asking you this. Have you ever had a terrible Airbnb experience where you were locked out and the host was unresponsive? Well, this happened to Francois on a skiing trip where the key for the door was frozen under the mat. And after finally getting in, Francois experienced several other problems with his stay, but his frustration is what later fueled the idea for his startup, Enzo Connect. And so Enzo Connect started off as a school project for one of Francois's classes at the University of Toronto, and it now has over 49,000 properties on their platform with an insane 0% churn rate, meaning no one has uh, that started using the platform has left. Essentially, Enso Connect is a guest experience management platform that leverages smart home devices and AI communication to provide a seamless experience to homeowners, property managers, and guests in the short-term rental industry. They are on a mission to create a home that runs itself. So Francois is the 25-year-old CEO and co-founder of Enzo Connect. He graduated from the University of Toronto with a degree in computer science and cognitive science, and he's also currently getting a master's in entrepreneurship at the University of Cambridge while also working on Enzo Connect in parallel. Francois brought... Skip that part. So in this conversation, we explore the problem Enzo is solving for both guests and property managers. We'll also hear about how Francois thinks about the user journey of travel and how he overcame the adversities of COVID. And finally, we'll touch on how he overcame the fear of jumping into entrepreneurship straight from college. So with that, let's go ahead and dive into the conversation. Welcome to the show, Francois. How are you doing today, man? Uh, thanks for having me on. Thank you so much for, for having me on. It's a, it's a pleasure to, I guess, share some of my experience. And uh, yeah, obviously, Daniel made the introduction. He is definitely the super connector. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I'm, I'm trying to get to that level, but we're, we're working on that. <laughs> All right. Um, cool. So yeah, Francois, to start off, I'd, I'd love to, if you could tell us a bit about who you are, your story, Maybe even what got you interested in entrepreneurship uh, and why you decided to be an entrepreneur, probably knowing or not knowing that it would be tough as hell, as I'm sure you for sure now know. <laughs> yeah, it. Uh, I, I never expected to be an entrepreneur so soon. Um, I always thought that I would push it back to later, get a job and then eventually start my own company. And I feel like that's a lot of people as they come out of their undergrad they're thinking, okay, I'm going to go work for a few years, get some experience, and then I'll start my own company. Um, and I had that same plan. And it didn't happen like that. <laughs> I ended up just mm-hmm. sort of starting a company. And it started off really as a class project um, that then eventually became a venture. To give you more of the story, uh, essentially, I was part of the University of Toronto, uh, studying computer science and cognitive science with a focus in computational linguistics. And as part of my final year, I took two courses in entrepreneurship, specifically around computer science. And we had to come up with an entrepreneurial solution for any problem that was robotic specific. And I absolutely hate robotics. So I wanted to do something more, (laughs) I I wanted to follow the course theme, you know? And so I I went more on the IOT side and tried to convince the professor that it would fit in his robotics thesis um, and and, and pursued that. (laughs) And it was, a personal issue that I that sprung this entire venture, Enzo Connect, that I'm going to obviously dive into a bit more, uh, of having had, a, a, I guess, a terrible Airbnb experience in Mont-Tremblant. And I set out to build initially a software that would help avoid those kind of issues for property managers, hosts, and guests alike. Um, and after my undergrad, I continued working on it, just kind of like a side project while I was finishing off a few other things. And 
next thing you know, I incorporated the company and started working on it full time. <laughs> so it was really an accident more than anything, I think. Yeah. Amazing. Well, I think life is spontaneous in that way. Uh, but it's funny how the entrepreneurial journey came to you a little sooner than anticipated. Um, and it all came with starting to negotiate with your professor <laughs> the, to let you do this. But I did actually uh, hear about the, the story. So I'd be curious if um, you kind of like, first, let's learn a little bit about Enso Connect. Like, what is it? Your 30 second to one minute pitch. And then, yeah, I'd, be, I'd love if you talk a little bit about that uh, awful Airbnb experience that turned out to not be so awful because then it resulted in this idea. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I'll dive into that, the founding story for sure. I guess, so the brief pitch is Enzo Connect is a guest experience management platform for the short-term rental industry. Uh, we leverage smart home devices and AI communication to essentially automate the whole process from pre-boarding, checking in, checking up, and getting the cleaning team. Um, our vision, it's super simple. It's crazy, absolutely. But we want investment properties or vacation rentals to run themselves. We want hospitality managers to focus on the hospitality aspect of their business and not the day-to-day, -day, uh, the tedious stuff. And, um, you know, moving it back, I guess, to the story and, and, and this terrible Airbnb experience that I, that I quickly mentioned, this is how it all started. I was part of this class. And at the end of the class, if you won, you would get $10,000. So, I made it my goal that forget all the other courses I had, this one's paying my tuition. So I may as well just focus on this one, this particular course and make sure I win that $10,000. And so I was trying to figure out what problem to solve. And initially I set out to build a copycat of smart things um, to control smart devices on one phone because I had that issue with my smart devices. But that first week when I went on a ski trip to Montemblant, and if, if you know me, you know I love traveling, but I love spontaneous travel. I have a bag in my apartment where I have my passport, a pair of boxers, some socks, a few you know clothes, and I'm ready to go anytime, anywhere. Um, and so this is what happened. My friend calls me up and he says, hey, you want to go skiing this weekend? I say yes. We hop in a car, and while we're driving, we're looking for an Airbnb. And so we find one that's instant book, which means you don't have to, to – confirm with the, the host, you just book it and you'll be ready to go and, and show up, which is a great feature, I think, of, of short-term rentals and Airbnbs. Um, we arrive at the, the, the Airbnb, the chalet. The key is frozen under the doormat, three centimeters of thick ice. So we're out there with lighters trying to unfreeze it. Then we get into the unit eventually. Um, <laughs> keep in mind, it's like minus 30 degrees Celsius um, for, for Americans, uh, listening to this, oh, I have no that. idea what that is in Fahrenheit. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but it is just cold. Hell, hella fucking cold. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So we get into the unit and then we're trying to turn up the heating and we realize it's per room. Well, actually we didn't realize it. It was per room. And so we only got the living room heated up. So we all slept in the living room. Uh, and throughout the state, we were trying to ask questions to the host, but he just wouldn't answer. He wasn't answering his phone. He wasn't answering phone calls, Airbnb messages or anything. Three days later, I think we check out and the, I get a message four days after checking out from the host, a text message finally saying, um, the pipes in the kitchen are frozen. You owe me $5,000. If you don't pay up, I'm going to send you to small claims court. Now as a student, and if you're a student listening to this, you probably know you don't have $5,000 to just send out to an Airbnb host because you accidentally left one of the windows open. So the pipes in the kitchen froze. I'm pretty sure I closed the windows and Airbnb's policy is he never communicated with you. And he asked you this four or five days after checkout could have been someone else. So we weren't liable. Uh, he never actually sent me to small claims court relationship kind of ended there. And I guess I got a very bad <laughs> review on my account. Um, but it made me realize why did he not communicate with us? Why did he not have a smart sensor in his kitchen to tell him it's going to be minus 20? He doesn't live at the at the chalet or in the area. He needs to be able to know what's going on in his unit. And so that's what we set out to build. And initially it was a property management software. And I guess when we dive into more of the problem and, and COVID and things like that, we've shifted into a guest experience management platform. So once again, leveraging the smart tech, leveraging the AI communication and making sure that you're constantly communicating with your guests and you know what's going on in your house or your apartment or whatever it might be without intruding on that guest's privacy. So it really started with a personal problem and it has evolved into a new beast that now I've realized or we've realized as a team that mm -hmm. a lot of people have been facing these kind of issues. 
Um, so yeah, it's, it's an interesting problem yeah. to solve and it's a complicated one for sure. <laughs> That's fascinating. Yeah, I'd love to hear more about the problem. And especially because something that uh, Switch Goswami in episode number six mentioned is that both the problem and the solution iterate, right? So I'm sure like what you described initially during your Airbnb experience where there's a problem of not having communication and for the host uh, that's managing the property, there's a problem around not knowing what is going on in the property or if something's wrong. So there was problems on both ends, but I'm curious, like, is this still kind of the main problem that you're solving for or has the problem iterated or how would you describe the problem now? The, the solution to the problem has remained similar, but has definitely changed. The problem itself has been reformulated. And um, I guess, I mean, it, it stays the same for all types of softwares that are trying to assist short-term rental hosts and property managers. It's about time. Time is money, and we're trying to make sure that you don't spend so much time managing your short-term rentals. Uh, so whether you're a property management software or you're a revenue management system or whatever it might be in this space, you are going to be solving a particular vertical that involves saving time. In our case, it's the most time-consuming element that hasn't really been mm -hmm. solved, and that's communication. And that's uh, the IoT aspect feeds into uh, the communication for those who don't know iot is internet of things and that's like smart home devices and so on your lexus google homes and smart locks um and and so yeah the, the core problem that we're we're solving is the time spent managing a short-term rental it takes on average um about you can manage seven listings seven to ten listings per person per account manager uh and it takes up to 10 hours for a single booking per week to to manage that booking so we're talking checking in instructions, sending out messages, making sure the guest is happy, checking up on him, coordinating the cleaning team, making sure that the, the, the next reservation comes in on time and so on and so on. So there's all sorts of things as a property manager or as a host that you need to do in order to run a successful short term rental business. And what we're trying to do is lower your operational costs by saving you a lot of time and making sure that you can scale quicker, meaning no more 10 hours per listing managed one hour instead and instead of managing seven per account manager you can now manage 60. um so that that the tangible and and quantifiable elements to what we're we're doing i think are are really the key and the formulation around the problem like how we're doing it or what are some of the the smaller problems have definitely changed over time but the core problem of time has remained the same uh, for us uh, for the past year and a half interesting yeah so really it's on the host side, right? Because this is a two-sided marketplace where you have both the the host and the guests. And the host can you can also think of them as you said as the property managers and maybe even like the owners and whatnot. Uh, but really, the main pain point for them there is the time that it requires, right? So the idea is if you can minimize the time it takes to manage each property you're able to scale the amount of properties that you own without having to hire more people. So it not only right. saves them time, it also saves them money, of course, right? The two are connected. Um, and it also like allows them to just um, scale more easily and provide a better experience for the actual guest, right? So I'm curious if you could also talk there about what the problem is for the guests, like what are the pain points they experience? Absolutely. And I think so you touched up on something that's really cool. It's, you know, there's two clients in this space. Exactly. There's the host and the client and the guest and systems like us or property management softwares and all that they sell to hosts to your owner, property mm -hmm. manager and so on. But they tend to forget the impact on the guest. And I think this is where why we've positioned ourselves as a guest experience management and not a property management platform is because we realize that our clients client is essentially driving the revenue for us. Um, we'll dive into the business model aspect of things, but because we have a commission model, we need those guests to have the best state and continue to come and come back at the unit, stay there, pay more, et cetera, because yes, the host is going to make money. The owner is going to make money, but we're going to make money on that as well. So I think seeing visualizing those two um, is is really really important we haven't seen that too much in the space. And I think that's one of the differentiating factors uh, in how we're approaching the problem. Um, um, and in terms of, of guests, I mean, I'm sure anyone listening to this has stayed in an Airbnb and the best example I can give you is a shitty check-in. We've all had a shitty check-in in an Airbnb. 
for the past seven, eight years that we've really been using Airbnb, everyone has had one example of a bad Airbnb experience where you show up and the host is late or you arrived late and the host couldn't make it. There's countless examples of, of check-in issues. And companies out there have been trying to solve this in different ways, whether it's with slightly better communication or with smart locks or lock boxes, or even in some more archaic cases, the key under the doormat, in, in which case it might get frozen, but uh, let's hope it doesn't, <laughs> right? And so people have been trying to find different ways to avoid showing up in person because there's going to be conflicts of schedules and so on. And you want to make the experience as smooth as possible. And I think one of the key things is to touch up on the guests problems is how COVID-19 has accelerated new problems where our solution is even more beneficial. And what I mean by that is, um, think of it this way. Nowadays, no one wants to meet the host in person. It's COVID. It's a pandemic. You don't want to show up and shake hands and, and spend time with the host. You just want to show up, get to the unit, enjoy your stay and move out. And that's, that's where we come in, really automating that process for the guest and providing them with unique experiences, checking up on them all the time whenever they need something. And we're trying to push it even further by connecting them with the community around. Um, we, can, we can dive into that, but I don't, I don't want to hog the conversation here uh, on the importance of community with, with what we're doing. Yeah, no, and um, I think that's really interesting. And one other thing that comes to mind is that uh, keep in mind that it's not just when you go to an Airbnb, it's not just important that the host and the guests are happy, but Airbnb is a middleman and they care that the host and the guests both have an exceptional experience. Because if you as a guest go to an Airbnb and you don't have a great experience because the host like didn't respond or because the host didn't do something well, then Airbnb also suffers because then you'll be like, oh, Airbnb sucks. I tried it out when really it wasn't really Airbnb's fault. It was more so that the host wasn't communicating properly. And Airbnb like doesn't really have a ton of control over that other than like, I don't know, banning a uh, bad host or just leaving negative reviews and whatnot. Yeah, no, they're a marketplace essentially. I mean, people oftentimes blame Airbnb for a shitty listing or something like that. And it's, they're just a marketplace. They've opened up the doors for people to market their homes as vacation rental homes, whether it's a shitty one or an amazing one. And that's why they now have different tiers, super host, luxury, things like that, so that you can differentiate the, the shitty ones from the, the best ones. But at the end of the day, it's the host's job to make sure that his business, his home, his investment property is being leveraged in a safe way and it's being leveraged in a way that's profitable for him where he can actually see mm -hmm. the benefits of, of putting it on this platform. Um, so th there's, a lot of, there's a lot of issues in this space that need to get fixed. Uh, the more I dive into it, I could dive into thousands of problems with the short-term rental ecosystem. Um, but the one we've decided to focus on is communication, is guest experience. Uh, because that one is a particular vertical that not a lot of people have touched yet and where we think we can do best. So, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, very important to be aware of all the problems that are very close to you because those problems give you a sense of uh, where you could move into, right? Like this is your primary focus, but then from there it's like what are adjacent problems that I could move into and that kind of starts to create a potential path for the future. Um, so Absolutely. yeah, very interesting to touch on that. Uh, cool. I think I'd, I'd, uh, it'd be great if we could dive a little bit into the, the solution, your, your product and how that works, how this solves, uh, how it solves these problems. And we can dive into also, if you want to talk about the business model and the community aspect. Yeah, hundred um, percent. So as I said, Enzo is a, a guest experience management platform. So what, what what does that mean? So essentially, what we're doing is we're helping you unify your communication across multiple platforms. We're talking Airbnb, Expedia, Booking.com, VRBO. You can have a listing on all those platforms. We collect that information, and you can communicate with your guests in different ways, all in the same place. Airbnb message, text, email, WhatsApp. You'll see it all in a unified inbox and your guests, he can pick and choose or she can pick and choose how they want to message you. Now, what we do from there is we automate every step of the way. Now that we've solid, solidified this, this, you know, inbox or system or what I like to call the engine um, of, of Enzo Connect, 
then we add all of the value add. So we're talking about scheduled messages, things that can be sent out at specific times that you know will have to be sent out, welcoming instructions, uh, how to check out certain information, a chatbot that we call Jarvis after Iron Man's um, <laughs> equivalent. Great name, great pick. <laughs> uh, yeah, right? And it automates, um, the goal is to automate up to 80% of your communication because what we've noticed is guests tend to ask the same shit over and over. Is the pool open? How do I get in? What's the Wi-Fi password? What's a cool restaurant around? Things like that. And so it's always the same questions. COVID-19, the top question that we've had is, uh, is the pool open? Um, <laughs> it's like the go-to question. So these need to be automated. You shouldn't have to wake up, you know, and and, and deal with that or, or, you know, go to work and have to answer what the Wi-Fi password is. All that stuff is automated with our, our, our chatbot. And then once the guest arrives, now that you have that process of being able to fluidly communicate across multiple languages uh, and automatically without actually having to do much, we want to, we, we're, we're automating every other step of the process. So getting in, smart locks. Checking up on the guest, making sure that they're having a good stay, that's the communication piece, but it's also the noise sensors. If they're having a party, you know about it, but instead of just knowing about it and then having to pick up your phone at two in the morning and calling them to, to tell them to tone it down, communication comes in. We send an automatic message via the favorite medium of that guest saying, hey, listen, you're too loud. Please bring it down or else we're going to get some complaints. One, two, three times. Okay, now we'll ping you and we'll tell you this guy keeps partying. So maybe you should handle um, handle it. And those are, are sort of the core steps of how we're trying to automate the entire process with smart home and communication. But we're trying to take it even further than that. What we really want is a system that runs itself. People talk about retention and how, how, how often does your person or your user go on your app? We don't want our users to go on our app because we want our app to run everything for them. That's the whole purpose of what we're trying to build. We want Enzo Connect mm -hmm. to run their investment properties from the pre-boarding all the way to the checking out without them having to do a single thing. Now, obviously that's a dream and it's a vision and we have to get there. And so there are certain steps and we've started with the communication piece then we've moved into the smart locks and the noise sensors, and now we're moving into other types of devices that will help push that vision further. Wow, that is brilliant. And one thing I want to highlight here is how uh, deliberate you've been about mapping out the user journey and making sure you understand what the problem is at each step. So, for example, it's like, okay, what happens before uh, you even book a place or before you even go to and travel to that location? It's like, what communication is going to go on there? And then it's like, okay, once you're actually there, what is the experience like, right? And then afterwards, the checkout, right? So you have these different phases. And at each phase, it looks like you've taken the time to understand what the problems are, what the pain points are, and how you can design solutions like the communication or connecting the smart home devices to detect the sound and be able to send alerts. And also, like, uh, use the smart locks to be able to automatically integrate all of that. Um, Absolutely. So and, and the cool thing to, to add to what you're saying is, um, you know, when, when you do the problem searching, right, you're going to find the core problem. Now, ours was time, time spent managing a short-term rental. But when you actually dive into what you just said, the different steps, you realize that there are different problems for each step. And they might be smaller problems that you wouldn't be able to build a whole company around but it could be a problem that you can solve as part of the bigger solution that you're solving. Oh, um, so you, you put it perfectly. We categorized everything according to the different steps. And from that identified the different types of problems that people would face. And we box those in to the different types of customers that are out there because a luxury property manager is going to have a different problem set than your, you know, the guy who just has a property in Toronto, who's just trying to pump some cash or the guy who's running 100 units for someone else, or the guy who has an arbitrage model. And so each customer is slightly different. Unifying the different problems that they have is what's allowing us to create a solution that works for all. And from that, we can start customizing and building out branches, just like Airbnb does with the luxury, the super host, and so on. Similar approach with the different features and packages that we offer, if you will. Interesting. Okay, that's actually what I think is... is um... The genius component of this solution is the system behind it, right? Like when I was looking at Enzo Connect, it's like, okay, you have smart home devices, you have smart locks, you have a communication system. And it's like all these small components, like individually, they already exist and there's solutions for those things. But what you're doing is taking all these existing solutions and creating a system around it where the communication uh, Jarvis AI is the interface 
to interact with that entire system and ecosystem of products. Uh, so the genius here, the genius here is that there's because it's a system and it has so many individual parts. As you said, you can focus on the smaller problems, and you know if you only solve that small problem, it wouldn't be that big of a deal. But because it's part of a larger system, the systemic solution is really what makes you unique and valuable, both rare Absolutely. and valuable, and that forms a competency bundle that sets you apart. The best way to put it is we're building an ecosystem. We're building an ecosystem yep. of different companies that are out there. You know, we've got a, a partnership with a company called Autohost out of Toronto that does guest verification. What they do is pre pre boarding, right? They they go in and look at the guest profile and make sure that there's no sketchy thing. Is it a 23 year old guy renting a 16 bedroom place saying he's on a romantic trip with his girlfriend? Probably something sketchy. Why does he need a 16 bedroom? Uh, you know, mansion or whatever to, to have a romantic getaway, mm -hmm. probably because he's going to have a party. So, you know, we're, we're not going to rebuild or reinvent that wheel. They do an amazing job at it, but we're going to connect that with our communication tool. And next step, checking in smart locks. Great. They already exist. We're not going to invent them. We're not going to rebuild them, but we're going to connect them so that we can automate that part noise sensors and so on and so on. So we're really about connecting the different pieces and the different verticals into this one guest experience facing platform. And the, the real key takeaway is that on the guest side, they don't see any of that. They just have a mm. fluid experience. They don't have to download an application. They don't have to go out of their way to do something to unlock the door. I mean, today's current model for being connected with smart locks in the short term rental space is essentially sending a link to your guest to download an app to then put in a few codes, sign up, do all sorts of stuff, and then they can unlock the door. I, there's no way I'm fucking downloading an app to get into a unit. Like, I, I just want to get in. That's it. Why would I go through 16 steps when you could have just given me a key? It would have been faster. And that's where we can really bring the smart value of smart homes. And as I like to quote Jeff, um, Jeff sits on our, our board. He's the, the former founder and CTO of Smart Things. You know, it's all about making uh, his company was called Smart Things. And the idea behind it was to bring the smart and smart home. And that's exactly kind of what we're doing. But instead, <laughs> we're bringing the smart oh, and smart huh. hospitality. Um, so, yeah, it's it's a it's a fun journey. There's a lot of moving parts, a lot of <laughs> API connections and all sorts of, of complexities around that working with different businesses and so on. But I think that's what really makes our solution unique is the ecosystem that we're building. Wow, I love that. Uh, systemic solutions to systemic problems. Uh, that helps make something unique. Um, cool, so two, two last questions here on Enso Connect. Uh, I'm curious, one, what is, what is the business model? How do you guys make money? Absolutely, so we have a very simple business model and we're looking to switch uh, something up in it. Uh, essentially, it's a commission model. So a flexible pricing model, uh, one to 2% commission per night per listing. The advantage behind a flexible model, I'll, I'll give you guys the advantage and the disadvantage. The advantage behind it is um, if you are a, this, is, this goes back to my view of traveling, because I want to be able to leave and let's say be a digital nomad or a remote worker from anywhere. I want to be able to go to Costa Rica, work there for a month, right? But I still have this liability of an apartment that I'm renting and I got to put it on a short term rental. I got to do the management of it, et cetera, et cetera. By having a flexible model, what we're allowing people to do is not force them to pay every month, even if they're they're living there or whatever the reason may be. So it just, you know, if you're going to put it on Airbnb, we're going to take a little commission because we're going to help you automate that management process. But and that, that's how we're currently operating. That's what we have. The, the, that's what our customers are paying. Uh, but we are actually also looking for um, we're currently looking at building out a more fixed model because some users uh, would prefer paying more, but knowing that they're paying every month a certain amount. Um, so we are opening that up. So it's a very simple business model, one to two percent commission or a fixed pricing model that's still being explored right now. Um, that's that's the core business mm. model. Interesting. Yeah, no. And it's a matter of like testing it, seeing what works. And I'm sure that's part of the experimentation phase as well. Not only on Absolutely. the product, but also on the business model. I feel that we're, we're still very early stage. So, you know, there's still certain things that we're exploring, seeing what sticks, what doesn't, what we do know. And I think this is what the key focus should be for every entrepreneur, regardless of pricing models and revenue and, and all the financial aspects is, are you solving a problem that people need, people want, people are eager to, to get solved, or is it a eh, nice to have? You know, and if it's a nice yep. to have, good luck pricing it because people aren't necessarily going to want to pay for it. They'll, they'll be glad to use it. It's nice to have, but they might not want to pay for it. 
But if you're solving a key problem that's so intense that people are like, why are there no solutions out there? Right? We're talking about users that have been shifting from one system to another every six months. That means it takes them like two, three weeks to get set up on a system and they shift every time. Every six months they go on a new one. We, ha we have a 0% churn rate. Now we don't have as many clients as them, of course, as some of our competitors and so on, but we have 0% churn rates right now because we're sticky. We're making sure that we're solving oh. the core problems that people need. And that means the pricing model, the revenue streams, they're all going to come flowing after. Uh, but we do obviously have a structure for that as we're building the product. Wow. Yeah. Zero churn. That is a dream for any startup. <laughs> yeah, we're and that so it doesn't mean much because, you know, for all we know, in a few years, we're going to start seeing those numbers go up and so on. But for the time being, it just shows that people are willing to stick with us for, for, for the long term. Yeah. It's a testament to how real the problem is and how good your solution does at solving that problem. Um, so that's amazing. Uh, actually, there's two other questions. One, one I'm going to ask is um, COVID. And I ask about COVID because I think travel was one of the things most affected. So how did COVID affect you? I'm sure there were insurmountable uh, and numerous challenges. Uh, so yeah, I'm curious what happened there and how you overcame those challenges. Yeah, um, COVID, COVID was a really tough time. And, and it, it, it's very, it was very depressing in many ways because you, you, I've been building this out for six to eight months. We had just raised fifty thousand dollars from a from a fund in, in the UK. We were entering our, our first fundraising, and I was super excited. And then this pandemic happens, and it kind of crushed everything. And people were talking about travel's not going anywhere. Blah blah blah. You're talking to investors; they're not interested in travel. They all just want to invest in a vaccine or health related health tech and so on. Uh, so it was a bit depressing at first, and. You know the signals that we weren't get, we were getting from whether it was from investors or or, or people around it, it wasn't positive or negative it's just inexistent because people weren't aware of where things were going so you know we i think this is where resilience is one of the key elements of entrepreneurship because perseverance we just stuck with it. yeah perseverance we just stuck with it and instead of chatting with investors and trying to, to sell the the bigger dream we went back to the customers and we asked them what are what are your current problems now what are you facing what are the issues and obviously the core issue that we're facing was simply we're not getting any bookings now there's nothing i can really do about that other than maybe call up the governments and say open up borders so people can travel and that wasn't necessarily any wise idea to, to do that but <laughs> it made me dive into a bit other problems and i realized the other issue they were facing was their operational costs they were still paying they were still and it reinforced the communication issue they were getting maybe two to three times more messages because of people canceling and they couldn't handle it because when you have a hundred messages coming in in a single day on average, and now you're at 300 and you had one guy that you had hired for a hundred messages, you now need three people for 300 messages, right? You can't have that one guy handle all, all 100 messages. I'm, I'm giving a very simple example here, um, but except these messages aren't about bookings, they're about cancellations. So you can't be hiring three people to answer cancellation messages. It doesn't make it doesn't make sense, right? So this is where the problem shifted and, and went from us building a property management software, which we realized was um, a bit overcrowded. There are too many out there and, and they differentiate themselves in very unique ways, but people aren't happy with them versus mm -hmm. building a guest experience management platform. Being able to directly interact with your guests and automate that aspect is more important. So that was mm -hmm. one of the things, um, you know, just sticking through it, spending two, three months speaking with customers, not really building anything we reduced our our own operational costs and just went back to the root went back to wow. the problem and i i always say this to new entrepreneurs you don't you don't start um a company with an idea you start a company with a problem and and this is the key to, to it all whenever i hear someone come up to me and say i have an idea it's a great business idea my first question is what problem are you solving and if they can't <laughs> answer it you don't have an idea and yeah. the the, the follow-up on that is if you tell me no one is doing this then there's also a problem. Why is no one doing this? It's either because it's such a unique idea or because no one cares. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's finding that balance, but at the end of the day, it's all about the problem. And, and I like how you focus on this on your podcast because I think, you know, people tend to forget that. They like the fancy, the shiny, the the bling bling idea, but they forget that at the end of the day, what what is successful is is the problem that you're solving. Yeah, no, and that's why I focus on that in this podcast because I think it's probably the most fundamental thing in entrepreneurship is to make sure you're solving a real problem. And it's not only to make sure that you're solving a problem, but it's to make sure that you are analyzing what the magnitude of the problem is. 
So I talk a lot about uh, what is the magnet, what is the, the scale of your problem? How many people have it? What is the frequency? How, how often do people experience a problem? And what is the intensity of the problem? Well, like when people do experience it, how bad is it? Or is it bad or is it just inconvenience? And fourth, like is the problem growing or is it declining over time, right? Yeah. And all of those kind of help you get a better sense of what really is the true magnitude of the problem. Um, Absolutely. So yeah, thank you for emphasizing that. Um, yeah. I was going to ask one last question here on Enso, but uh, I think you kind of answered it. And it was uh, like on the vision, like what would the world look like if Enso was to achieve its its uh, vision, its ultimate destiny? Absolutely. So, I mean, I have a very futuristic vision of, of Enso because I love smart homes. I think, you know, the devices and the power of sensors and, and the devices that are out there today are underserved in many ways or under leveraged. Um, yeah, we have an Alexa and we ask it for an alarm or to play music or a recipe, but it has so much more benefits and potential that hasn't been fully leveraged yet. And so my vision for, for Enzo Connect is a home that runs itself. And what I, what I mean by that is not just the checking in and checking up, et cetera, but all, going further than that. And it ties into the community aspect that I brought up earlier. And that is to create a personalized experience for each guest every time. So we're one of the unique elements of how we structure our data, for example, at Enzo Connect is we're, because we're very much focused on the guest, we structure it around the guest. We collect all the guest's information and create almost a, let's say a behavioral package, if you will. How do they behave in the home? When do they check in? Are they late check-in type of people, late checkouts? You know, do they go in and out all the time? Are they loud people? Do they play music? And once we can create that, that personalized component, my vision for this for this company is to be able to create the most tech-driven personalized experience around that smart home and connecting that experience with the community around. Short-term rentals are banned left and right in some countries and some cities because of regulations. And the reason they're banned because of regulations is because of complaints. And the complaints come from bad operators, bad guests, and in my opinion, bad property managers. Property managers that are not able to handle the right guests coming into their properties, creating, you know, you've got disorderly conducts and all sorts of issues around that rental, and it just trickles up to the government that ends up banning it. But, and, and, and the community doesn't like it and so on. But if you can tie in the community aspect, if you can, you know, connect the coffee shop with the guest, you know that guest loves coffee and may as well recommend him that local coffee shop or this place to eat or that museum to go to. And you can create these, it's like the future of travel agencies, if you will, but all automated in a system and in your home. And it's not you running that system. It's your actual home running that system for you. Mm -hmm. that, that's sort of where I want to take it. Um, and where I see it, I see it in every vacation accommodation from hotels, motels, B and B's, chalets. I want it in every single location, every country, mm -hmm. and every type of, of short term rental. Obviously, we've got a, a few steps to prove before we can get to that level. But mm -hmm. you know, we're in twelve countries in six months, so I'm, I'm, I'm happy to to continue to grow at this pace. <laughs> yeah, no, you're well on your path to fulfilling that vision, and I love the simplicity of. Uh, c communicating it as a home that runs itself, especially with the s support of the local community that where that place is at. Cool. I love that. Um, so next, let's let's dive into uh, a bit of like uh, the psychology and the mindset behind entrepreneurship. So you're a 23 year old entrepreneur and you started Enzo Connect right out of college. Right. So before you started your company and you made this initial entrepreneurial leap, I'm curious, what were some of the fears, doubts, limiting beliefs or insecurities that passed through your mind? And how did you end up overcoming them or reframing them? And like, are these things that you still experience? 100%, 100%. I, I, any, any CEO or company executive that tells you he doesn't have any fears and everything's clear cut for, for the next few months, years or whatever is lying to you. Um, it, definitely. I mean, there are always times when I'm, I'm questioning and doubting some of the, the decisions I make or, or, or the decisions our team makes, but that's, you know, I'm going to jump back on that. It's the team. It's, it's cool. It's, I'm working with amazing people from advisors and we're talking, we've got, you know, Daniel that you've had on your podcast, who's a great friend and a, a huge mentor for me. He's really helped us, uh, scale Enzo. Got Andrew Kitchell, the former founder of, of Lyric, Jeff Haggins from Smart Things. I surround myself with people that motivate me, that believe in what we're doing, and that are helping us grow. 
there are going to be doubters. There are going to be people who tell you that it's impossible. And you keep picking at the solution. You keep finding different ways. Um, to give you an example, getting a partnership with Airbnb. It was one of the first problems that we faced. Um, we needed to connect with Airbnb's API in order to collect information about the reservation. Now, there was one solution, which is what we call an iCal, which is connecting the calendar and getting that information from the calendar. A few weeks after building that out, Airbnb comes out with an update and they removed all reservation data from the iCal. And our whole system needs the reservation data. So we had to find another hack. And so we went out and found a hack into Airbnb system and it worked. We ran through 10,000 iterations before going live because we wanted to make sure everything was clean and cut. Airbnb noticed that and blocked our API requests. Oof. And so here I am like, oh shit, I'm supposed to launch this with a few homes and test out this product and we can't even get the partnership with Airbnb. How the hell am I going to do what I'm supposed to do? This is where the doubt and the fear comes in, but where the perseverance and just the, the will to make this happen, you know, also comes in is I start going on, on LinkedIn and I start looking up all the people who are working at Airbnb who might be related close by or someone I could get in touch with to help me fix this. And I get in touch with someone at Airbnb in Toronto. I get a meeting, I show up, I present. And in my head, I'm thinking, these guys are going to give me a partnership. It's obvious. Like, this is the future, you know, like, why wouldn't they? And I speak to him and he's like, I love it. It's amazing. But uh, no, we can't. We, we, we can't integrate you guys because we're, we need more. We, we need you guys to show us more units, more, more traction, et cetera. And I'm thinking, how the hell am I going to show you more traction if I don't have Airbnb? How the hell am I going to get Airbnb if I don't have more traction? And you keep poking at that problem. And you start building decision trees and and different ways of formulating it. So, you know, I, I'm going a bit on a tangent here, but essentially what I'm trying to say is, yes, you do have doubts and you do have things that you're unsure of, but you surround yourself with the right people. And eventually you work to find what that solution is. You build out different models. You try, you fail, you try again, you fail again. And eventually certain things start clicking. And what I really enjoy about doing podcasts like this is I get to reflect back on the little wins. So when you're working on a day to day, it sometimes seems like, you know, it's not working or there's this new problem and I have to deal with this HR related problem or this fundraising problem or this problem. And you just constantly new problems, new problems, like give me a break. Right. <laughs> but when you reflect back, you're like, shit, I've actually been getting a bunch of wins. And like, you know, we had 68 homes a year ago. We've got 49,000 bookable rooms now. Right. We had one city that we were in. We're in 12 different countries. I don't even know how many cities right now. So you look back at those little wins and you're like, wow. And then you look at your vision and, and you realize, okay, I'm so far out still. <laughs> I still have miles to go, but it's cool to be able to reflect back and realize you might be scared. You might have to make certain leap of faith here and there. But at the end of the day, if you know what your, your the North star is, that vision is, and you are resilient to get to that, it's just about executing, executing each step of the way. Yeah. Oh man. What a great point you bring up. I mean, the truth is that there's always going to be problems, no matter what, like problems are just a natural part of life. And so yeah. if you always look at like what problems you have, you're going to just feel overwhelmed and tired. But yeah. like you, we often fail to look back and be like, whoa, look at all those problems I've solved that I exactly. once thought. And for some of them, you once thought like, how the hell am I going to solve this? And if you look back to a time when you've done something you thought was impossible, oftentimes that reflection is what gives you the confidence in the moment to overcome whatever challenges or problems you have now in the present moment. And so I always like to think from a mindset perspective of the yin and the yang of self-acceptance, like looking back and being happy with how far you've come and what you've achieved, but also the yang of self-improvement. It's like, hey, Absolutely. let's keep looking forward for what we need to do and what we need to uh, solve, what challenges lie ahead. And if you look back and feel great about where you've been and you look forward and you look at the opportunities that exist in front of you, you'll have the uh, the energy and the confidence to actually tackle them. 100%, 100%. And I, I think that's a great analogy actually for that because it's really about, it's building that confidence and that and that momentum and uh, the motivation around around achieving those goals. I mean, the things that we've done now, I, I don't think we would have, I would have, imagined it necessarily back then. Um, it was part of the roadmap, et cetera, but you know, I didn't actually realize that we'd be able to achieve certain things. And, and we have miles to go. And once again, I'm, I'm trying to stay as humble here because we are tiny and we're, we're still growing and so <laughs> on, but it, it's part of each step of that vision. We know where we're going and we're, you know, we're essentially, I like to put it as a, we're, we're sailors on a ship. I'm steering the ship. I've got 
all these people, amazing people helping me out, you know, got the sail and the mast and everything and just making sure we're headed the right way. And we're in a storm and we're constantly in a storm and, and we've got to readjust and so on, but we know where we're going. And that vision, we know that that vision and that, that achievable vision is, you know, a really successful point, let's say, for, for what we're trying to, to do. It, yeah, there's a lot of money involved. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. I love to see you on, on the path to fulfilling that vision. Um, so cool. Just like um, as a final segment here, I want to go through some quick rapid fire questions. I'll, I'll actually ask you just three. And the first is what entrepreneurship related book or resource has impacted you the most or would you recommend the most to other young entrepreneurs? Yeah, I, I have a, a whole library of them, but there's two in particular. Uh, the first one is The Lean Startup, Eric Ries. It's my Bible. Um, in fact, one of the reasons I named Enzo Connect Enzo is Enzo is a symbol of Zen. Um, hmm. It's a circle that you draw in one uninhibited brush, brush stroke. Um, it's, uh, it's really nice drawing. And I had gotten it tattooed like two, three years ago unrelated to Enzo Connect. I hadn't even thought of Enzo Connect at the time. I'd gotten it tattooed because why not? It was cool. And my parents were, my, my mom specifically was like, what the hell? Why did you hurt yourself and get a tattoo? That's horrible, blah, 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 blah. And that Christmas, my sister gives me a book and it's the Lean Startup. And guess what? On the cover is an Enzo. So that's kind of why I named Enzo Connect. Wow. Enzo is because it had that symbolic element and that book specifically is, is really important in understanding, I think, the problems that you're solving and, and going back yep. to the roots of entrepreneurship. Another one that I like, which is a fun read, is um, The Hard Thing About Hard Things. Uh, I'm, I'm not fully done with it yet. I'm halfway through right now. But so far, I'm really enjoying it because it really shows like the, sorry for my language, but the fuck you pain points that some entrepreneurs have to go through and like the mm -hmm. mountain of stuff that you have to overcome. But how, you know, I don't know. It shows a good difference between the hard work and, you know, the news that you see of all the success, et cetera. But like, you don't always see like the amount of blood, sweat and tears that have gone to getting that, that successful article written or whatever it might be. So I, I'm enjoying that book so far, but I'm only halfway through, but definitely read um, the, the lean startup. That's, that's a Bible. Oh yeah. I vouch for both of those. Okay, cool. <laughs> this next question is just for fun, but are we living in a simulation? Hundred percent, hundred percent. I I do think so, but it's a simulation. It's the question of free will. I could go into hours about this, like the behavioralism <laughs> theory and things like that. But the quick answer is, I do think that we are in a simulation. But there's a certain level of control that we have on that simulation. Roof trippy program. Yeah. We were our our free will was programmed or not? Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> All right, and the last one here is. Um, Let's actually fast forward to a time in the future where we now have an AI that knows everything about you, Francois, and the universe. So if you could only ask this AI one question, be it about yourself or the universe, what question would you ask? Um, it, would, I, it would probably be around objective truth. What is objectively true? Oof, what is deep. objectively true? Because everything has a percentage of everything's a stat. That's how I see things. Everything's statistically true or false, which means it's not <laughs> objectively true. So what is objectively true? You know, like a, a simple example is this is white. This piece of paper is white. Well, it's white for me, but is it always white? Is, you know, I'm, I'm giving a very basic example here, but I'd be interested to know if there is anything that's objectively true. It's a dangerous question because it can go into nihilism and, and all sorts wow. of other uh, dangerous, um, not dangerous, but interesting topics. But yeah, that, I think that wow. would be a question. <laughs> that is a deep question. Yeah, we have to realize that things that are objective to us are subjective to our perceptions and our senses. Um, so, you know, like I'm colorblind, for example, I might see that as you know, a different shade of white. <laughs> there you go. So so, maybe it isn't white because you see it in a different way, <laughs> yeah. whatever it might be. Yeah, no, I mean, I've had this debate with my co-founder quite a few times. We get into some heated debates about objective truth and uh, it's always fascinating. So I'd love to get the actual answer to that. <laughs> we're, we're all working on it. <laughs> Amen. All right. Uh, final, final closing question for you, Francois. So what I'm curious if you have any closing thoughts, a message or advice 
that you would give uh, young entrepreneurs that either want to get into entrepreneurship or want to take their startup to the next level? Yeah, my biggest advice is just do it. I mean, Nike's motto, <laughs> just do it. Seriously, don't don't even hesitate. Don't make excuses. Don't think, oh, I'm going to do this first and I'm going to go back into it, et cetera. Just do it. Jump right into it. And I understand, you, you know, different situations for different people, uh, whether it's your financial situation that doesn't allow it or the fact that you have a family or things like that. But find ways to still just do it because it's a thrilling experience and, you um, now's the time like now's the now will always be the time not later if the idea if you're having the idea now and the problem is now then you should be solving it now not in two years that would be my advice my core advice and then the, the one i initially said which is don't start with an idea start with a problem <laughs> yeah core yeah no and now really is the best time um no matter what just because like quit pro one quit procrastinating and two literally getting funding is easier than ever technology is more accessible and faster and affordable than ever so uh turn your ideas into reality because you no longer have to just dream you can actually make it fucking happen so cool 100%, 100%. with that francois uh thank you for coming on to the show it was a pleasure talking uh and yeah we'll be sure to leave your socials and enso connects details in the show notes but uh yeah thanks for coming on man i love talking to thank you thank you so much no i appreciate it thank you so much for having me cool see you guys we'll catch you in on the next episode